The events of the story take place over the course of a few nights. Before we get there, I need to provide a little bit of backstory. My husband and I had just moved to New York City, like right in the heart of the city. The apartment was breathtaking. I kept thinking that it was a loft apartment you would see in a movie or a television show. My husband was fortunate enough to land a well-paying job that allowed us to afford this beautiful apartment. My favorite part was the view. At night you could see all the lights from the city out of the windows. It didn't take long for my husband to make some friends at work. He's a very social person and being in sales for a decade makes it easy for him to strike up a conversation with anyone. Almost a year into living in the city, we had our weekend crew that we would hang out with routinely. We would have dinner, play games, or just have some drinks with Becky and Jim as well as another couple, Jason and Liz. But my husband's best friend from the city was a man named Eric. Eric did not have a significant other, but never came alone. He always had a friend that he would bring. He would always joke with me and my husband. Don't worry guys, you never have to worry about me being the third wheel. This turned into a reoccurring joke and Eric was almost referred to as this third wheel. One night after one of our little get-togethers, my husband and I were getting ready for bed. We talked for a while, but I'm pretty sure I fell asleep mid-sentence. I woke up at some point in the middle of the night. I didn't look at the time, but it was still dark, so before 5am if I had to guess. I heard a noise and I know that it's what woke me up. I just laid in bed feeling a bit uneasy and looked up in the dark room. I thought I could see a figure of some some kind in the corner of the room. The more I tried to focus, the more and harder it was to see. I felt as if though I could almost hear something like breathing or wheezing. After a few minutes I felt much better and chalked it up to some kind of vivid nightmare and rolled over back to bed. I was too scared in the moment to look and didn't want to wake my husband up for something that was probably just a giant overreaction. The next night came and same story. We went to bed at around 11. I didn't tell my husband about the events of the night before. Again, I was awoken in the middle of the night. This time I looked at the time and it was shortly after 4am. I could for sure hear breathing this time. I looked around the room from the bed but this time I couldn't see any figures like I did the night before. I could just hear the breathing and it felt so close. I tried waking up my husband but he was out cold. I didn't try awfully hard because he had to wake up in about an hour for work. I didn't sleep well the rest of the night and I woke up with him in the morning and did not want to stay in the bedroom alone when he left. I moved to the living room and slept on the couch for a couple of hours. The day was miserable. I couldn't shake the weird feeling for the entire day. Around 2 in the afternoon I took a shower. When I turned the shower off and was drying my hair in the bathroom I heard something from outside the bathroom door. I froze in paranoia in the bathroom and listened with my ear to the door but heard nothing. Finally I worked up the courage to leave the bathroom and felt a minor moment of relief when I was in fact still alone in the apartment. Shortly after 5 my husband came home from work and I told him about the events of the last two nights. At first he laughed as if though I were telling him a joke. Once he realized how freaked out I was, he then began to try and rationalize what I could have been seeing and hearing. I have to say I was insulted because he even suggested that maybe I had too much to drink, but that was not the case whatsoever. He then said in a reassuring voice, Listen, if it happens again just wake me up and I'll search the room. This actually did give me some relief that I was able to talk to him about it. However, I was still anxious that I would hear or see something again. That night came quickly and I was so tired from the previous night that I fell asleep even though I was practically petrified to go to bed. Again, right around 3.30 in the morning, I woke up to the sound of breathing and it was undeniable at this point. I looked around the room and saw nothing, just like the previous night. I woke up my husband and told him to listen. He said he could hear the breathing too. He sprang from the bed and turned on the light. There was thankfully nobody standing in the room. That brief moment of solace ended quickly when that nightmare came true. My husband walked over to the walk-in closet and emerging from under the bed was our friend Eric. He sprinted towards my husband who was now in the closet and tackled him. 
I screamed in panic, absolutely freaking out. I jumped from the bed and tried to make a run for the door. My plan was to just yell in the hallway until someone hopefully heard me. I didn't even make it to the door before Eric had caught me. I screamed as loud as I could and thankfully in that quick moment my husband sprang out and tackled Eric in return. I ran to the cell phone and called the police. My husband is a fairly large man and was able to get Eric to the ground and keep him there and subdue him until the cops showed up. To the police's credit, they showed up incredibly fast. My husband only had minor scrapes and bruises, but had a pretty big knot on his head. When the cops were arresting Eric, we could hear him saying, I didn't want to be the third wheel anymore. I didn't want to be the third wheel anymore. What's even more disturbing is that he told the police he was inside of our apartment for a couple of days. He had somehow stolen my husband's key and made a copy of it. He was apparently breaking into the apartment for weeks, but had been staying during the night for the last few days. I'm not sure why he didn't try anything while we were sleeping or any of the times myself or my husband were alone in the apartment. It still freaks me out thinking that this man was inches from where I slept. We're now back in my hometown and not living in the city anymore. The terror you feel being trapped that high up in the sky with nowhere to run has made me extremely claustrophobic. You never know what people are capable of, even people you consider close friends. The police did inform us that Eric stated he didn't intend to hurt either one of us that night, but the look in his eyes told us a completely different story. I am writing this story just days removed from the most traumatic experience of my life. I wanted to write down all the details while they were fresh in my mind. I am from a fairly bigger city in New York State, not New York City. Once a year, for as long as I can remember, I would travel up north to the mountains with my family and stay in a cabin. This was a family tradition that I kept long into my 20s and I still go today. Well, maybe not anymore. I am now 26 years old and travel to this beautiful cabin with my girlfriend Rachel. This place was beautiful. It sits high on the mountains and overlooked a lake. From the back deck you could see the lake and the surrounding trees. Escaping to this nirvana was the peace of mind I look forward to every year. The story starts about two hours away from our cabin destination. Rachel and I stopped at a rest stop to get some snacks and coffee for the rest of our trip. As we pulled away to get back onto the highway, we noticed a large white truck with two kayaks pulling behind us. We laughed, assuming that this truck was probably just following us all the way to our destination as there is many spots to kayak up in that part of the state. Our theory, however, seemed to be accurate. We were just ten minutes away from our cabin and the truck was still following behind us. This didn't set off any red flags because, like I said, this was a popular place for tourists, especially this time of year. We eventually reached our street, we turned on the dirt road, and as we turned, we noticed the white truck kept driving. We jokingly laughed and said goodbye to our traveling companion. Our cabin was about a hundred yards or so down this dirt road. The place was like a dream home. All wood finishes, high ceilings surrounded by lots of trails, and as I previously stated, the beautiful view over the lake. That first night we were there was lovely. The weather was perfect. We sat on the back deck, stared at the stars, and just listened to nature all around us. The next day Rachel and I went into town to see some local shops and get closer to the water. We had a bit of a laugh when, to our surprise, we saw the white truck. It was parked in a lot by the marina. The only reason why we knew it was the same truck was because the same dirty kayaks were attached to the top. I jokingly said to Rachel that if the driver were there, I would have introduced myself, but there was no driver anywhere near the vehicle. Nothing more than just a crazy coincidence, we thought. After spending a couple of hours in town, we finally went back to the cabin to enjoy the scenery for the rest of the afternoon and evening. At about 7pm, I thought I had heard some rustling in the trees to the left of the deck. I grabbed my phone to take a picture of whatever animal emerged. I could not make out any details of any animals or anything of the sort. I could, however, clearly hear the breaking of branches and rustling of leaves 
but could not make out anything. Then I thought I heard what sounded like a cough from my right side now. I immediately turned to my right and started looking into the woods from that side but again saw nothing. I suddenly had that sickening feeling that I was being watched. I sat like a deer in the headlights just waiting to be attacked on all sides but whatever was in the woods but nothing ever came. Later that night after we ate I told Rachel about the experience I had and she turned white as a ghost. She had told me earlier when she went walking through the woods she thought that she had also heard coughing but just chalked it up to her imagination. We talked about maybe calling the property owner or even the police just in case but we both agreed that we were being neurotic. That night we decided to sleep out in the living room in front of the fireplace. The living room was amazing. It had two huge sliding glass doors that overlooked the lakes and mountains. We figured we would sleep there, stare at the moonlight and stars, and then wake up to the sunlight shining in. Unfortunately, this did not go as planned. We both were jolted awake shortly after 2 a.m. to a loud bang. I sprung from all the pillows and blankets we laid on the floor to witness one of the single most horrifying things I had ever seen. There was a man at the sliding door. At least, I think it was a man. The figure was tall and menacing, but most frightening was his mask. He had an owl mask on, but the mask had antlers on it. The figure had one hand up, positioned on the glass door, almost as if he were waving. The other was concealed behind his back. Rachel screamed in a panic, and somehow was able to utter the words, Call 911! I could have gone out there, but I was too scared and had no idea if this person had a weapon. Then I remembered hearing noises in the woods from all sides, so I began to wonder if there were others out there as well. I thought it would be safest to stay inside and just keep my eyes on the figure. The cops took about ten minutes to get there and that was the longest ten minutes of my entire life. Rachel cried and screamed. I had a knife from the kitchen in my hands, and we just stood face to face with this thing like a western stare down. It didn't move. It just stood still with one arm up and the other behind its back the entire duration of the ten minutes. Finally, when we saw the lights of the car, the guy retreated into the woods. I ran out to meet the police officer who had no sense of urgency whatsoever. I tried to explain that we had an intruder and he ran into the woods, but the cop just kept telling me to relax and explain to him what happened. Long story short, the cop was no help at all. Basically, he told us that the locals don't like tourists, and he was sure that this was just a prank of some teenagers from the town and we had nothing to fear. That was why the figure didn't cause us any real harm. Rachel and I were completely unsatisfied by this. The cop came, took our statement, and essentially left. Rachel and I sat in the living room still completely shook to the core with fear. It was now a little after 3.30am and we decided this was enough. We were going to get our stuff and leave, probably stay in a hotel for the night and contact the property owner in the morning. We packed our stuff incredibly fast and made our way to the door and once again we were struck frozen in fear. There at the front door were two figures, smaller than the first one but still wearing owl masks. Out of fear, we turned and ran to the back door, and the figure from before was there, the taller figure with the owl mask and antlers. We called the police again, but we feared we didn't have ten minutes to wait this time. In unison now, all three figures tried to open the doors. We ran to the master bathroom, which had a window in it, We began to climb out. We tried to be as quiet as we could and ran down the dirt road. It was pointless to scream for help because there was no other houses anywhere near our cabin. We got to the main road and called the police again. The cop met us at the side of the road. We said we were not going back to the house. The cop agreed to take us to a hotel in town and as we began driving, several yards down the road both Rachel and I became frantic. There parked in the thick brush on the side of the road was the white truck with the kayaks. We told the cop, who still seemed a bit apprehensive, but took the statement. The next day we went back to the house with some police. It made us sick to our stomachs. The entire house was ransacked and destroyed. All the windows were broken, and all the decorations smashed up in the cabin. 
In the master bedroom where all of our luggage was, it was completely destroyed and thrown all over the room. When the cops went back to investigate the white truck, the truck was gone. Luckily, the property owner had some cameras on outside of the property and saw the three figures stalking the outside of the house for hours. Even more terrifying was the entire day and night before they were stalking the house as well. I'm just so thankful we somehow got out of this situation unharmed. The police unfortunately had no answers for us, couldn't locate the truck or had any leads to the people who did this. To a degree, Rachel and I actually wondered if maybe they were in on it. Rachel and I are still trying to recover from these events and I hope one day I can find a place that can give me that comfort of peace and tranquility again. New York City is a gigantic, sprawling place with people in just about every corner of the area. There aren't too many rural or non-crowded areas, so when you find places that seem untouched for years, it comes as a bit of a shock. I'm writing this story down for the first time to share my experience. My friends and I were pretty good kids for the most part, at least that was my perspective. We didn't really get into too much trouble probably due to the fact that what we thought our parents might do if we did get into trouble. Over the summer, before many of us were going to be heading all over the country for college, we decided to spend as much time as we could together. One of our hobbies that summer was to explore the nooks and crannies of the city and take loads of photos. We would find and explore all sorts of buildings that were abandoned, old tunnels, and run-down houses. Well, this specific summer night, we met up as we usually did and found this old building in a lesser populated area. At first, it was no different than any other building that we had found in the past. The inside was completely decrepit and filled with trash. It was always nice to try and imagine how the building would look before they were completely condemned or abandoned. We would usually try and research the location after we took pictures and kind of do a before and after. We took a couple of dozen photos and then noticed something strange on the far side on the main floor. There was an old tipped over bookcase, but the style of the bookcase did not match anything else in the building. It was almost as if the bookcase was too new for the space. Just out of curiosity, I lifted up the bookcase and there was actually a trap door underneath the banged up piece of furniture. After very little deliberation, we decided upon opening the trap door and exploring underneath the building. It was a small ladder that led to an even smaller landing. From the small landing was a staircase that led down to a dark room. The only light was the illumination of the trap door we had left open. We did have some flashlights and once we reached the bottom we all turned on our lights and looked for a switch. It didn't take long for us to locate the switch and to our surprise it had power. Similar to what you would see in the warehouse, we flipped the switch. One by one, each light turned on to shed light on a massive underground room of some kind. The room was largely empty for the most part except for two things. Several feet from the bottom of the stairs was a desk with pens. But that was it. No paper, no books, or anything else. Located all the way at the very end of the room, completely adjacent from the stairs, was a sort of vault of some kind. Incredibly curious, we decided to check out the vault, to see if it was open or if it was just a large door of some sort. Just to give you an idea of the scope of this room, the vault was probably close to 20 yards from the staircase. When we got to the vault, it was obviously sealed shut. At first, we just took a couple of pictures and then started to bang on the vault and try to open it. And that's when we froze in fear. We heard something bang back on the vault. Scared out of our minds, we started to bang frantically on the vault door and the banging from the other side got more intense as well. We thought maybe it was some kind of echo or something like that. But this theory went out the window when we started to hear other noises coming from the vault. It sounded almost like a siren or maybe even a scream. We weren't sure but decided to sprint out of this building both in shock and fear. Once outside of the building, we made sure to get away as soon as we could in case we actually did set off an alarm. From what we understand, the police did show up, but found nothing in relation to the vault. 
Apparently, we were the only ones who were potentially breaking the law. A few weeks later, against our better judgment, we decided to go back to the vault. We carefully made our way to the open room, but to our surprise, this vault was actually now open. I admit we were intrigued as well as scared, but decided to look inside anyway. It was a huge vault. Inside was empty crates that looked like it was made of damp wood. Blankets filled most of the floor and lots of paper plates that had food scraps on them covered the remaining floor opening. The space inside the vault was big enough for several adults to fit in comfortably. We took some photos and left. The place was just too creepy for us to spend any more time inside. After that night we started coming up with all sorts of theories. Was someone living or squatting in there? How was this vault door closed the last time we were there? Was someone trapped inside? The next summer when all of us were home from college we decided to go back one more time but were stunned when we arrived at the building. The building had burned down and there was nothing left but rubble. We tried to locate the whereabouts of where the trap door would be but could not locate it through the now wasteland of debris. We have no idea what we heard that night and still talk about it to this day. We often come to the consensus that we're happy we didn't end up on the other side of a closed vault. Whenever I tell people that I'm from New York, they assume New York City, but in fact there is plenty of other beautiful places in the state to live. I live out of state now, but during the events of this story I still lived in upstate New York. Anybody who is familiar with upstate knows that there are some absolutely amazing places to hike. About three years ago, my friend Summer and I decided to go on a hike. We drove about an hour or so from our hometown and found a nice long trail to explore. What was nice about our hike was that we found a really secluded place and dove almost right into the woods. There was a couple of beat down trails on the road but nothing that could have stopped us or made us feel like we were trespassing. Summer was really good about navigating forests, being able to identify poison ivy and just keeping exceptionally good bearings, which is good because I was absolutely horrible at all that kind of outdoorsy stuff. We traversed for about 40 minutes or so off the main road into the woods. It was gorgeous exploring these woods that looked untouched by humans. Then out of nowhere, the most peculiar thing happened. Forty minutes off the main road in the woods was a bench but the bench was completely destroyed and dirty. If I were to sit in the bench, it would probably collapse. We took photos of this strange forgotten bench and continued on our journey. Probably about 50 yards away, we approached a small chain fence that seemed to stretch for a couple of yards. Behind the fence were these small huts. That's really the only way I can describe them. The huts were built with wood, metal, wire fencing, street signs... Pretty much anything you could think of was used for walls for these tiny little buildings. Pretty creeped out at this point, Summer and I approached the small buildings. They were completely taken over by nature and inside there was a single chair, some lockers and tons of decay and debris. We kept walking and eventually approached these two giant black tubes that almost looked like pillars of some kind. Against our better judgment, we kept exploring and asking ourselves the question, what is all this? The compound, or whatever you want to call it, really opened up after the black tubes. There were now dozens of these small little huts. Our next big moment of disbelief was in the giant pile of debris that sat in the middle of all these huts. There were telephone poles, all smashed up and broken. But on these wooden beams that lay in the dirt, there were light switches and wire. Whatever this creepy place was actually had electricity at some point. The only thing that gave us some peace of mind was that there was no way anybody could have lived here now. It looked like it had been abandoned since the 60s or something. I only say that because there were statues, trash, and items that were really looking like that style. We started to look a little bit more in depth in some of these small huts. There were statues of Santa Claus everywhere religious iconography, and fake flowers. At every turn, there was something different and strange. There was a bus that seemed like it was cut in half. Inside, it was furnished with chairs and lights that were completely covered in moss and vines now. 
On the far side of the compound was severely overgrown weeds, and parked in the weeds was an old truck. Again, this truck had all sorts of weeds and bushes growing out of the windows and doors. We made our way to what seemed like the end of all of this craziness, but then it just got weirder. There were tons of naked mannequins all over the place. They were hanging in trees, in the weeds, half buried in the dirt. They also had no heads, which was deeply unsettling. Coming from the other direction, we saw a somewhat bigger hut than the others. Just to give you a bit of context in case I wasn't clear, these huts that I'm describing are maybe big enough for a small child to live in. They were smaller than most cars, but this one hut, this one was slightly more than double the size, and on the far side of the hut was what appeared to be a hollowed out oil drum. The small building was filled with tons of religious statues and carnival equipment, like old circus items. The feeling Summer and I had at this time was that of paranoia and fear. We decided we'd seen enough, and it was time to go. As we approached the first set of huts, we heard shuffling coming from within the small compound. We froze completely in our tracks. We were so far off the road, and in the middle of the woods, clearly nobody could be here, but we heard the shuffling. This could have easily been a deer and any other number of animals that made these woods their home, but her and I both had this same feeling, a feeling of just darkness and pain. We didn't want to wait and see what it was, and we decided to move rather quickly and run from this place. We made it back to the car in about 20 minutes, which is half the time it took to get to these huts. We got to the car and actually were greeted by some cops. The cops told us somebody called in complaint that some kids were trespassing and up to no good. We explained to them what was in there, and even tried to show some pictures, but they were not having it one bit. Basically, they told us to leave immediately if we didn't want to get detained, which we both thought was extremely excessive. If anybody out there had ever seen anything like this, any idea what it could be? We thought maybe some kind of home for a circus, perhaps workers of some kind. The only thing that made it so outlandish was how deep it was into the woods and how far away it was from any kind of town or city. I've never been back, and I have no desire to ever go back. I'm writing this in hopes that somebody has stumbled across something similar and may have some additional information they could share. Anybody who has ever camped up in the Adirondacks area of upstate New York knows just how breathtaking and beautiful it can be any time of the year. Last year I stayed with my family in a cabin that rested in the mountains. I had recently split up with my longtime girlfriend and it seemed like a wonderful place to go to clear my head. At first, my theory was correct. It was therapeutic and beautiful being out in nature, and was nice spending some time with my family. One of the really nice things about this cabin was that it was truly separated from any other residence. The closest cabin or campsite was probably at least a mile or more away. And this meant we had total and complete privacy, or so we thought. One late afternoon, probably around 5 p.m., we heard some shuffling coming from the front of the cabin. We were sitting on the back porch and heard some movement that sounded like footsteps. A little on edge, my brother and I got up and got ready just in case we needed to leap into action. All of a sudden, two middle-aged men walked into the back where we were sitting. I asked in a very abrasive and annoyed voice, Hey, what are you doing? Can I help you with something? The men just looked and laughed and said in a cheery voice, <laughs> Well, hello there, young man. My name's Lewis, and this is Tito. We just really wanted to check out the view at this place. We heard so many wonderful stories. The man seemed sincere, but something just didn't seem right to me. I still looked at them with an uneasy feeling in my stomach, but my mother, who was a very friendly person, made small talk with the man. Perhaps the most unsettling thing of this entire interaction was the friend Tito, who was just standing around looking at the house with seemingly no facial movement or anything. Lewis was charismatic, smiled a lot and made lots of eye contact, where Tito was almost the opposite. After several minutes of small talk, they vanished back into the woods. 
I was not a fan of this at all and quickly let my family know about it. Where were these guys coming from, I thought. As I stated previously, the closest place was about a mile or so away and that place belonged to the guy who owned the cabin we were staying in, so Louis and Tito must have been hiking for a little while to get to our cabin, which is not unlikely up in the Adirondacks, but something was off about that entire interaction. It bothered me all night. Around 11pm, my family went to bed and I sat around a fire with my brother and his fiancée. Every little noise I heard caused me to jump. My brother told me not to worry about it and I was just worrying too much over nothing. I pretended everything was okay, but really I was still uneasy about our unwelcome visitors. Shortly after midnight, it was just my brother and I around the fire. We decided to let the last few logs burn out before we went inside. This is when Lewis decided to pay us another visit, but this time he was not so friendly. My brother and I jumped out of our chairs and were now facing Lewis and Tito who were coming out of the woods. They looked crazed. Lewis did not have that same charming personality as before. His eyes were bulging from his head and he flashed his pearly white teeth in an almost sadistic way. Tito, who was almost a statue earlier in the day, stood next to Lewis, also smiling and slowly approaching me and my brother. Lewis started to slowly approach us and said, this cabin is lovely. I think we'll be staying here now. He reached into his bag as if to pull something out. Tito, who was slightly behind him, was already wielding some sort of bushwhacking sword. Not trying to take any chances as to what Lewis was pulling out of the bag, my brother decided to tackle the man. He went down with relative ease. As Tito approached my brother with the sword, I ran over and pushed him strictly only using adrenaline as my motivator. Both men got up and backed away. Lewis, now standing about ten feet away, kept saying, You have no idea who I am and who you're messing with. I built this house. This is my land. After repeating this a couple of times, Tito finally spoke up as well and said in an almost robotic voice, We shall have our land back. We must wait for the right time. Tito grabbed the shoulder of Lewis and they both ran into the woods. Remember, this is after midnight, in the middle of the woods, so it was pitch black other than a soft orange light from the dying fire. We put the fire out rather quickly and went inside the cabin and made sure all the doors and windows were locked. My brother and I stayed up all night and basically watched the property to make sure they didn't return. I've never been so happy to see the sun in my entire life. The next day we went to see the property owner and told him about the entire night. He said he had never heard of the two names before and assured me that no Lewis ever built that house. The owner who we were renting the cabin from told us that he built the cabin ten years ago. So who were these two that claimed that they built the cabin? The owner was kind enough to refund us for the rest of the nights we were supposed to stay at the cabin. I know this could have ended much worse for us. And all things considered, I am very lucky that I left with no more than some minor psychological damage. Be safe, everyone, and always lock your doors. You never know who could be creeping around outside. I work for a local health facility in western New York and for the last three to four months I have been able to mostly work from home. This has caused a significant change to daily operations but I'm thankful to be fortunate enough to still have a job. Due to financial difficulties in the organization we have had to restructure and consolidate certain departments. Instead of working strictly for my local department I now also fill in for one of our satellite locations that's about an hour away. Even though I am mostly working from home, I do have to go into the office both locally and at the satellite location a few times every couple of weeks. The first time I went to the satellite location, I was introduced to the staff and the layout of the office. They surprisingly had more people in the office than I expected, but it was a large department where they could accommodate the appropriate social distancing guidelines. Everything went well and the team was very friendly and welcoming. As I was getting ready to leave, a gentleman named Jared ran up to me and apologized that he had not been able to introduce himself. This seemed nice enough, but 
He was pretty close to my personal space and everyone else I encountered had done a great job of keeping their distance. I backed away slightly and told him it was no problem and it was nice to meet him. He then followed up with, nice to have a female around here. Not knowing how to respond, I just kind of gave a fake laugh and said, well, I better get going. As I began to walk away, he didn't say anything. That is, until I got to the door and I heard, I'm sure I'll be seeing you soon. Accompanied with an arm flailing wave. Fast forward to two weeks later, where I had just gotten home from another commute to the satellite office. This is when I began to notice some weird occurrences at my house. As soon as I got home, I noticed that the door to my shed was completely open. That was odd, because I always kept it closed so that my dogs wouldn't get in there, and it also had a padlock on it to prevent anyone from going in and stealing anything out of it. I went outside and noticed that the padlock was gone, but everything in the shed looked intact and nothing seemed to be missing. I closed it and put a reminder in my phone to pick up another padlock the next time I was out. Over the next few days, I couldn't shake a feeling of being watched. I felt this weird sense of paranoia and anxiety. I have a window in my home office and could have sworn that I saw the same black car drive by my house at least a dozen times. I brushed it off and got back focused on my work as it was starting to pile up. I worked until about 5.30pm that night and decided to take a break to eat some dinner. When I got back at around 7pm, I noticed that the light near my webcam was on. I checked to make sure that it wasn't on because I left one of my meetings open from earlier in the day. There were no active meetings open, but the light remained on. I freaked out and covered it with a piece of paper and tape. Shortly after I covered the camera, the light went off. I decided that it was time to go to bed and that I would call IT in the morning to make sure that nothing was wrong with my computer or the system. I got into bed and fell right asleep, only to be awakened by what sounded like a door slamming coming from outside my window. My dogs had clearly heard it as well because both of their heads were perked up and pointed towards the bedroom window. When I looked out the window, I got a queasy feeling in the pit of my stomach. It looked like the same black car that I noticed going up and down my road over the last few days. I couldn't tell if anyone was inside the car, and now my dogs were walking around the room wanting to go outside. I let them out into the backyard, and as soon as the sensor light went on, I saw that the shed door was open again. The dogs ran, barking like crazy towards the shed, but as they approached, they seemingly lost interest and made their way to the other side of the yard. Terrified at this point, I knew I was going to have to look into the shed and to make sure there was nothing or no one in there. I called the dogs over to be near me just in case, but as far as I could tell there was nothing in there. As I went back inside, I peered out of the front door window and noticed that the black car was gone. I went back upstairs and locked the bedroom door and tried to go back to sleep. I got up very early and contacted IT to let them know what happened with my computer. After some investigation, the IT guy who seemed very annoyed that he was working said that they had already received a few complaints on this issue and that an internal employee had been terminated for attempting to gain access onto other colleagues' computers. When I pressed for further details, he said that I would have to reach out to HR for more information. I didn't reach out to HR and figured I could just continue to monitor things and report anything out of the ordinary, plus my mind was still distracted from the night before. Two days later, I went back to the satellite office. After a long day of work, and as I was getting ready to leave, I overheard two people talking about Jared. They were saying that he was no longer with the organization and that the rumor was he was accused of stalking and trying to access other employees' work computers. For a moment, I thought about joining the conversation and asking for more details, but I decided against it. As I began the hour drive home... Thoughts began to race through my head. Was what I had been experiencing over the last few weeks caused by a deranged coworker? Was this all just one big coincidence? I don't know if I will ever have that answer. All I know is that several weeks have gone by since these events occurred, and I haven't noticed anything out of the ordinary. The anxiety and paranoia have subsided, but I hope I don't have to experience something like this again.
The events of this story took place when I was 17 or 18 years old. For our school trip that year, we were scheduled to take a bus to New York City to see a play and do a few hours of sightseeing. It was a one night overnight and only possible because my hometown was approximately three to four hours outside of NYC. There was a substantial number of chaperones on the trip, but we did have some independence. We were able to stay in our rooms, but we had assignments for who would be staying in what rooms. The hotel itself looked like it had been converted from an old apartment building. The outside was completely brick and didn't look like any hotel I'd ever seen before. The inside looked nice and seemed clean. Our room consisted of me and two of my close friends, Tim and Joey. I remember that during the day it was extremely sunny outside, so much so that I think I got sunburn on my face. Joey was the one in the friend group that could make anyone laugh. He was always busting everyone's chops or trying to pull off a prank. I remember we brought a video game system to try and hook up to the hotel TV, but we either didn't have the right cords or the hotel TV didn't have the right adapters to allow us to hook up the gaming system. With that plan out the window, we quickly became bored and were looking for something to do. Probably for 30 to 40 minutes, we all just sat with our faces buried in our phones, probably texting our other friends who were on the trip. Joey suggested that we go walk around the hotel and kill some time before we were ready to go to bed. We agreed, but knew we had to be quiet because I think technically we weren't supposed to leave our rooms, I don't honestly remember. I remember feeling really cold in the hotel. It was probably a mix of the temperature dropping and getting burned by the sun earlier in the day. I grabbed a hoodie before we left the room so I could throw it on in case I was still feeling cold while we walked around. We began by just walking around our floor, waiting to see if we saw any other kids from our class who had the same idea as we did. The floor was actually pretty quiet. We didn't hear much of anything except for a super loud ice machine. The ice machine had some vending machines near it and we decided to grab a few sodas and some snacks. That way if we got caught out of our rooms, we could have just said we needed something to eat or drink. Just as we were about to head back to our room, Joey decided that it would be hilarious to take my hoodie and throw it down the trash chute. He grabbed the hoodie from my hands, opened the chute and dropped the sweatshirt in and closed the door. All of this happened while Tim and Joey were basically crying with laughter. Joey then told me to relax and that a hotel certainly wouldn't have a garbage chute that dropped garbage either outside or to a basement. Yeah. He opened the chute door back up and wouldn't you guessed it, my hoodie was gone. I could tell that Joey was genuinely shocked and felt really bad. I told him to forget it and started to laugh so he wouldn't continue to feel terrible about the situation. As we got another 20 steps down the hallway, heading back to our room, I stopped in my tracks and started patting my pockets. My phone... Where was it? Oh man, it must have been in the hoodie pocket or in my hands when Joey grabbed the hoodie. I stopped both Joey and Timmy and told them I think my phone accompanied my hoodie down the garbage chute. At this point, Joey's face turned ghost white. I knew it was an accident and he had no idea, but that was Joey. Anything for a laugh. We started to think about what we should do. Should we tell a chaperone? Should we go to the front desk? We figured it would be best to try to find it ourselves to avoid getting into any trouble. I remember that the elevator had a button for the basement, so I figured we could hopefully head down there, find it, and turn to our room before anyone noticed. When we got to the basement, it was really dark and we couldn't find any light switches. We used the light from our phones to try and navigate the area. It was still pretty difficult to see, but we were able to make our way around. I had Jolie calling my phone constantly, but I always kept my phone on vibrate, so it was unlikely we would be able to hear it. We probably walked around 5 to 10 minutes, but all we were really able to find was washing machines and what looked like linen and cleaning product storage. We made our way back to the elevator, but when we got there, there was an out-of-order sign on the elevator door. How could the elevator have stopped working in such a short period of time, and how did someone put a sign up there without us hearing? The out-of-order sign also had a smiley face on it, which we thought was kind of weird. At this point, we just wanted to get back to the room. Yeah, I'd be in trouble with my parents for losing my phone, but we were starting to get a little freaked out and decided it was best to get back to the room before someone noticed we were missing. 
We started walking around the basement again, trying to find a door or an entrance to get us to the stairs so we could get out of the basement and back to the lobby or our floor. After a few attempts, we did find a door that led to a flight of stairs. However, the door to get out of the stairwell to the lobby was locked. Starting to panic, we had to see if we could find a way to get outside. Thankfully, we were able to find another door that led us outside rather quickly. Breathing a deep sigh of relief, we figured we would just go to the lobby, ask if anyone had reported a missing phone, and then head back to our room for the night. As we pivoted to head back to where we thought the main entrance would be, Joey yelled, Hey, look over there. There were two dumpsters and one of them had my black hoodie hanging on top of it. Joey grabbed the hoodie and started feeling around to see if he could find the phone. Unfortunately, he couldn't feel the phone but began climbing it to see if we could hear the vibration or see it light up. After a few attempts, I told him it's probably gone and we should just go inside. Not going to lie at this point, I started worrying that maybe I just left it in the hotel room and how angry Joey and Tim would be if that was the case. We got back to the room seemingly unnoticed and got ready for bed reflecting on our experience that we had just went through. We had some laughs and started to doze off to sleep. I was jolted awake by Joey shaking me violently. Once I realized what was going on, he said, Why are you messing with me? You think this is funny? Me, barely awake and having no idea what he's talking about, just gave him a confused look. Joey showed me his phone and he had two separate texts of me from 1am. The first one showing a picture of the out of order sign on the elevator and the second saying, come find me. It took a few minutes convincing Joey that it wasn't me messing with him. Once he realized it wasn't me, he became concerned as to who would be sending the messages. I told him to just block the number and go back to sleep. I told him I would tell my parents my phone was stolen and that I wanted to change my number. After about another half hour of talking about the situation, we went back to sleep until our wake-up call in the a.m., Apparently, Joey disregarded my advice and didn't block the number. When he woke up, he had one more text from my phone that said, Good choice, with a smiley face. We didn't really talk much more about this instance as we didn't want the story getting around to the class, the chaperones, and then eventually our parents. I'm still very close to Joey to this day and sometimes every once in a while we talk about that night. I always ask him if he was just messing with me and he always denies it. I wonder who ended up with my phone that night, and I wonder if we had continued looking for it if we would have been in any real danger. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you've got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and remember to always butt-chug your coffee enema.